Today, people come to Jerusalem from all over the world because they know that God's presence was here. With only one God dwelling in one temple, Jerusalem was chosen to be a light to the nations, but there are many gods and many temples. This idea was revolutionary for the surrounding nations. King David's son, Solomon, built the first temple here. But tragically, Solomon and the many kings that followed him ignored the very first commandment and its declaration that God is one. God called Israel into special service. There was an entire world that had misunderstood who the Almighty was. And if Israel was to be that light of clarification to the world, then certainly Jerusalem is its beacon. It's a place that taught by its very essence that God is one. All you need is one temple. It taught that God is present among you. It's a place you couldn't think of doing without. Jerusalem must be forever because those messages are forever. And so it's so painful to hear the story of Jerusalem's destruction in the sixth century by the Babylonians. Why? Why would this happen? Well, because of what Solomon did there. Solomon married women from a variety of, of nations. And rather than bringing those women into an understanding of the one true God through the temple where God made his presence known, just here, instead of that, just there, he built temples for the gods of his wives so they would have a place to worship. That tension lives between these two places. God is one. God is many. God is present with you. God is remote. This tension had to be resolved. And so God warned the people again and again through the prophets, change your behavior, change your thinking. And when they didn't, the consequences were absolutely horrific and absolutely unthinkable. These homes right here were destroyed in the sixth century by the Babylonians. There were burned clay bulla or stamp seals. There were arrowheads discovered here. And in fact, in that toilet there, they found that the person who was using it in the sixth century was eating grass. The city was under siege. And that's all the food they had. It's unthinkable that this would happen to the beacon to the nations. The Lord said to Israel, look, if Jerusalem stops being a beacon to the truth, I will take away its light. So after many warnings by the prophets, God allowed the Babylonian Empire to conquer Jerusalem. The temple was stripped of its glory. The presence of God departed. And the light of the city of God went dark. The prophet Jeremiah described what he saw. How deserted lies the city, one so full of people. How like a widow is she who was once great among the nations. Bitterly she weeps at night. Tears are on her cheeks. She finds no resting place. Carrying only a few personal belongings, the people were marched for months into exile in Babylon. Not far from Jerusalem, harps are being made by Mika and Shoshana Harari. Their work is inspired by the hope for a new temple, which will once again host the Divine Presence. There's a piece of poetry in particular that I'd like to visit with you about because that piece of poetry 
tells the story of the Babylonian exile in connection with music. Mm. It speaks of the exile as the day the music stopped. I suspect as a harp maker and a harp player, you know Psalm 137. Uh, yes? Yes, may, I do. May yes. I ask you to share it with okay. me? By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willow trees because we could not sing the Lord's song in a strange land. The Bible speaks about 70 years right. of time outside of the land. Jerusalem destroyed, just a horrific experience. Homes are gone. People are, are deported from their homeland. The worship center, which uh, was so closely identified with a one God, God's presence and God's forgiveness theology, it, it's gone. The harp isn't just for personal use, but maybe the more common use of the harp was connected to the temple. So if, if, if the temple goes away, that's the music that stops. That's right. And this is uh, kind of a tragic but poetic way of putting the exile and how important it was, the music, that the music was part of our daily life when we lived here for thousands of years. The harp was an instrument of joy and blessing, yeah. of healing, of prophecy, of new songs, of creativity, of inspiration, of um, connection with the Creator. That's what the harp was all about. That's what it is all about. It's literally a way of making a certain frequency connection with the Creator of the universe. And when we hung our harps in the willow trees, it was because there wasn't gonna be connection. So so would, would you go so far as to say that when the music stops, yeah. God has stopped talking. He's still whispering. <laughs> whispering. God says, I will never release you and I will never forsake you. Mm -hmm. And that's so beautiful because it's like, oh, I, I've had enough of this. I just want to get out. It's like, no, 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 no. I will not release you. But again, I will never forsake you either. You're hearing this music stopping in Psalm 137 as something that will reverse. That's right. So when we hung our harp on the on the willow trees, we hung it up. We didn't stamp it out or throw it ah. in the fire or throw it in the river. We hung it with a, a prayer that, please God, someday one of our descendants will take it off the willow trees mm. and we will play music again. I love the balance that you put on that because sometimes with my Western ears, I hear hanging up the harp as resignation. I'm done. But you hear hopefulness yeah, in that. Right. You hear temporary set aside until we return and uh, play again in Jerusalem at the New Temple. That's right. Shoshana and her husband Mika have been making biblical harps for decades. They are likely the first ones to make authentic biblical harps in over 2,000 years. I want to show you this one is called the Kinnor. Kinnor. And mainly what you were what we were talking about is Psalm 137. Mm -hmm. It specifically mentions we hung That's right. our Kinnorot. This is the harp, the yeah. kind of harp that we hung on the willow trees. I want to have you experience it yourself by playing it. Wow. Okay. Oh, that's a privilege. Thank you. <laughs> you put your ear next to the wood like this and then very very quietly you touch the strings. Now, you probably didn't hear anything, no, right? No, I didn't. Right. This is the most private and kind of intimate way of prayer because mm, it's just mm, between sure, sure, sure. you. Start with All this. Right. Hold it over okay. your heart. So you hold it over my heart. Right. I put, put my ear. That's right. Put it up a little higher. That's right. And one at a time, play the strings very quietly. That's right. Can you hear this? I can't hear anything. It's probably good. <laughs> That is so enjoyable. All right. Wow. That has nothing on my piano or guitar. When the biblical poets talked about this instrument, it was more than a sound producer. It right. was a heart shaper. I feel the power in the, uh, in the language of Psalm 137 that we were right. speaking about before, because if, this, if th this instrument and this sound is so intimately bound to my worship in a place that now is gone. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see why, at least for a time, that's set aside. That's right. After 70 years in Babylon, some of God's people returned to Jerusalem and built a modest temple. 
But one important thing was missing, the visual presence of God. That special presence did not return until Mary and Joseph brought the infant Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, the story of God's love would reach its highest expression. So remember, when you read about this holy city, always look for how the Almighty is revealing who He is and how He thinks about us. I love Jerusalem and its stories. They give life and meaning to the rest of the stories of this holy land.